I'm going to talk about Eric Erickson's eight stages of man. We're only going to talk about six here. We'll take it up to about age 18. And I want you to compare that as we talk today back and forth. Because in the development of a human being, there are very, very many good characteristics that we would like to see developed. Drive and hope, self-control and willpower, direction and purpose in their life method and competence, devotion and fidelity, affiliation and love. Each of these is at a stage of human development where there is a crisis. Eric Erickson believed that you come to a certain point and either you develop the skill to get along in this world or you don't develop it. And if you're really tweaked and don't develop here, supposedly at age zero to one here during the first year of life, and you begin to mistrust the world instead of trusting the world, then you carry with you those feelings through adulthood. And you develop a script in life where you don't trust people. And it's hard for you then to be intimate. As you go through these developmental stages, the task to be developed is different in each one of these. In the early on, this infant, the major task that that child has is to find out if the world is happy or the world is unhappy, if it's safe or it's dangerous. And each one of you came into a home with a different environment, with different dynamics between mom and dad. Dad came into that relationship with certain strengths and weaknesses, and so did mom. And they developed a certain environment in that home that you sensed. They've done tests on babies before they were born, in the womb yet. And they could tell by the chemicals in their blood if that child was upset or not. We know drugs affect a child. We know what the mother eats affects a child even before it's born. But they hear music. They have all kinds of experiences in the womb. And the child, as it begins to understand and begin to hear and, and pick up through its sensory capacity, the environment around them begins to interpret. And they begin to decide not necessarily at a real conscious level, but they decide whether this world is a safe place or not. If their caretakers are loving and kind and gentle, and through touching, a child develops trust, or mistrust, if that child is yanked around and not changed when it's soiled, and the child, there's a lot of confusion in the house, and the child is frightened, and there's loud noises. Do you think a child picks that up? Even an infant, do you think they can pick up the tension with mother the way she holds that child or doesn't hold that child? Through touching and stroking, this is where that child begins to feel if the world is safe or not. We all need strokes, lots of strokes. And if we don't get strokes, then we'll get them the bad way. Sometimes children that are in hospitals for one reason or another, wars or orphans, or these children don't develop because they're not touched. They're not nurtured. They're laid in a crib and then they're fed. And there's so few nurses, there's not a place to take care of them. There's no one to watch them, really. And so the children are neglected. And there's a thing called marasmus, where these children fail to thrive. It's through touching and human relationships that we have happiness and that we have joy, also misery. But without that, with that void, with this idea that I'm not touched, I'm not loved, the world isn't happy, the world isn't safe because of all the noise, I might even be abused. I might wake a dad up at 3 o'clock in the morning crying, and I'm, I'm hurting in my stomach, you know, I can't communicate except through crying, and I'm crying, and they feed me, and they try to burp me, and Papa ends up hitting me. Shut up. i got to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, you've been screaming all night. You see... I can't have all trust or I'd be a nut. There has to be a balance between trust and mistrust. But generally, the first task of a human being is to find out whether people are good or bad, whether I'm okay or not, whether the world is safe or not. Now, supposing I'm raised in a confusing, loud, harmful environment. You know, this little computer's got nothing on it. It's got a blank sheet here. And what I'm recording is that the world isn't very nice. It's not very safe. Do you think that's going to affect me in intimacy later on? Do you think that's going to affect how I trust and how I feel about people? Do you think how it's going to trust how I feel about myself? Absolutely. So the first thing is trust. And if I have trust in my life, and I feel that the world is trustworthy and people are good, basically, with some exceptions, then I have the ability to have hope. Because if the world is predictable, all right, I can make decisions, I can hope, I can try. 
Now, in all of these things that Erickson was talking about, he talked about each level as a crisis, that either we make it and solve the task at that level and decide on trust or mistrust or whatever that particular skill is, whatever that crisis is, and as we do it, we develop a strength in our personality of self-control and willpower. When a child is small, it's really in a symbiotic relationship with his parent. And the child can hardly tell, doesn't tell the difference between himself or herself. He has no self-awareness, really. Can't tell the difference between himself and his mother's breast. They're just one. He can't tell the difference. As a child begins to get a little older, they begin to have a certain autonomy. And the child is raised in an environment then that whether the, either the child is allowed his emotions, his own emotions, or he's not allowed his own emotions. You stop that crying right now. You stop that. There's nothing to be afraid of. And the parent is saying... Basically, you think what I think, or you feel what I feel. You do what I say. And if the child is allowed to make certain decisions in life, then the child develops a sense of autonomy, that I'm different, that I have a willpower. Can you see where they're talking here? Willpower and self-control. If some other person is always telling me what to do, I'm a part of their will and their life and their thing, and don't develop my own selfness, my own identity, this autonomy here, then I will never, ever feel good about myself. I will have a certain amount of shame and doubt. And why would I have any willpower? Why would I have any self-control? I would have other control, somebody telling me what to do all the time. If you've got a child in this range, would it be wise for you to understand that that child needs to gain a sense of autonomy? Should we raise children without any conception of that at all? That I should tell this child what to do all the time? Or should I concentrate on things that will allow this child to feel that autonomy? To make decisions, to set certain goals down here, to begin to have their own self-control. Freud talks about this as they go through a retentive thing. It's time where you're learning to hold on and let go of things. And this is an important aspect because I decide if I will let go. You'll find the little child discovers gravity. He'll take his glass and hold it off to the edge of the high chair, and you'll go, ah! And before you can get there, what's happened? Smash. And you're cleaning that up, and off the other side goes the dish. And they're not being bad. You can't say, what a wicked little child. Why did God do this to me? The child is learning to hold on and let go, to, to exercise some self-control and willpower in his own life. And this is a very essential task. But if the child is not allowed to make these decisions, I don't care if it's just deciding what toys he's going to have. Do you ever get these children that say, no, no, they're getting this? A child hears no about 40,000 times before they go to kindergarten. Would you believe that? And guess who they hear it from, Mom? <laughs> but this autonomy thing is a very important thing. Do you really, really want to raise a child that does just exactly what you want and thinks what you want them to think? Is that the kind of being that you want? Yeah, my mothers are going like this. <laughs> okay. No, you don't. Who let her in? Okay. <laughs> No, you don't want to. You want to raise a human being with feelings and thoughts and a determination. And if that child is told that it's wrong to have autonomy, to do things on your own, that child then will develop shame and doubt. And shame is a very big word in psychology. It's a very big word, and we're going to talk about that. Okay, do you want a child that has willpower, that has self-control? Would, like would you like that? You say, my teenagers don't have any self-control at all. They have no ability to defer gratification. They just have not developed willpower. Why not? Erickson suggests that these are very early messages. These are very early developmental skills that they get into. I would like to know as a parent, if I could just have my kids back and do it again, maybe I could do a lot better job. I want you to know that I knew nothing. When I was in business, I had to have a license to open the door. If you want to do fingernails, you have to have a license. If you want to get married, you got to have a license, right? Is that true? To raise kids, what do you need? <laughs> you have nothing. And it's not required. And maybe that's really great, too. But it's sad that in America, we send people to school to study everything in the world, how to make a living, how to be an engineer, how to be a doctor, and we're not dealing with the most critical issues of life, and that's how to develop as human beings and to be happy. You can have all the money in the bank. I, I've talked to guys that have dads that got millions of dollars. Here, kid, here's 20 grand. Take a tour around the world. Do what you want to do. Happy birthday. The same dad, and this is a true story. I was counseled with this boy recently again. 
and he's got this big thing about his dad. He had to make an appointment with his father's secretary to see his dad. I'm not suggesting that you all get a secretary. That's not the direction I'm going. I'm suggesting that this father was so focused on his business that he didn't have to deal with the pain of raising a family. He didn't have to deal with his issues as a man, and boy, he's got some. He is driven. He's a workaholic. He is addicted. But as long as he's into his addiction and practicing his addiction, which in his case isn't booze, isn't women, it's work. It's just as sick. But he's neglected that family. And as long as he's addicted over here, that takes all his energy and all his focus, he does not have to deal with this boy here that he does not know how to relate to. And the boy's getting angry. He got a mitt for Christmas. He was really embarrassed. He was like in his teens. People, it was for the wrong hand. The dad didn't even know if he was left or right-handed. That's a true story. Is that tragic? A lot worse things than that are happening. And when we get angry and we know that we're doing something wrong, our emotions overpower our good sense. And then we just don't give a toot. I'm mad and I don't care. I know this is wrong. I'm getting it wrong and I don't care. We want children to grow up with these particular strengths. I had a friend, little Benny. I grew up with him. And little Benny got to do anything he wanted to do. My folks were strict. Little Benny got to ride the bus down to the pier and fish. Then he'd go to a movie. And I'd try to talk my mom into that. I was 10, 12 years old. I'd try to talk her into that. She'd say, no, son, you can't go. Mom, and I would beg and plead, please let me go. All the other kids are going. Do you know the story? All the other kids are going. Everybody says, you're the only ogre ma in the whole world. And they've got your picture down at the post office as being the meanest woman in the world. And you won't let me go to catch a stinking fish. Son, it isn't that. I love you and I'm worried about you. Inside, how did I feel, people? I knew she loved me. And even though she wouldn't let me go, she was worried for me. She was hypervigilant. But she was scared to death. Now, <clears throat> little Benny got to do anything he wants. And as a result... All he'd do if he wanted to do something was whine and cry and bellyache and scream until mom finally gave in. Little Benny's had about five or six wives. Got about 10 or 12 children around the country. Not all in marriage. He did anything he wanted. All he did is scream and yell. Never told no. Never learned what no meant. What is there about no that you don't understand? But little Benny's life is tragic. And then his parents stand back and say, we never raised him like that. We can't understand why he's such a bum. We never raised him like that. Well, they did. That's exactly the way they raised him. They gave in to him. They were not concerned with his development. Whatever was easiest for the parents, they gave in. And that's what they did. I think that that needs to be a very important aspect of what we do and what we say here today. Is that real love has to do with doing for that child what needs to be done for that child and that child's development. And a lot of times what a child needs is a real good dose of consequences, a real good dose of pain. And if a parent steps in and rescues that kid, there's some real tragedies there. All right, so to give you an idea of what is going on here with Erickson's stuff is kind of a little background. 